softly in a star who could know baby Jesus God's own son of human Knox Presbyterian Church, good morning. It's good to have you all here with us. Um, I wanted to give you a couple announcements before we begin worship. Uh, we, this is very exciting, have a new website. You could actually go there right now. You're not going to hurt my feelings. You're on your computer anyway. SpokaneKnoxPC.org. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time formulating this new website. We hope that you feel as we do that this is a good reflection of who we are and is a good way to be able to indicate to people who are outside of our church who we are. You can see in the top right hand corner there are a few different pages you can navigate to. One of them says give on it. This is the most exciting thing for me about the site is that we now have the ability to give online. So especially right now, when some of us are having a hard time bringing a check into the church, or if you're tired of using the postal service, this is a way to do one-time and reoccurring payments uh, for your tithes and for your offerings. Go ahead and take a look at that. We hope that this is going to be uh, a feature that ends up getting utilized by a lot of you for whom that's going to be uh, more convenient. Uh, as we prepare for worship this morning, I invite you to set aside this space. There are some of us, myself included, I just have a hard time getting into a worshipful environment when I'm not physically uh, led to do so. So you can create that right now. You could, by lighting a candle by just putting some items in front of you, like your Bible, maybe a cross, you can establish this time, these next 60 minutes or so, to be in a worshipful posture coming before our Lord. I invite you to do that now, whatever that is for you, as we begin our time in worship together this morning with singing.
song. As we come now to a time of prayer, I ask that we enter into this time with our hearts focused on, on heavenly things. There are so many things to focus on um, around us right now, but this is a time to, to enter into the presence of God. It is a holy place. So pray with me now, if you would. Father in heaven, we come to you with hearts full of adoration, with gratitude, with praise, because you are worthy to be praised. You are holy and you are good. You are faithful and kind, just and loving. We praise you for your work of creation, where everything that we see displays your wisdom. And we praise you for your work of redemption, that through the blood of your Son, our Lord, Jesus Christ, you have made us new again. You have brought us back into fellowship with you. You have adopted us as your children. And so we come to you confessing our need for you, our dependence on you, and our, and our desire for you. We cry out to you, Lord. We just ask that the things of this world that are in rebellion against you still, the things that we see in society, but also the things in our own hearts and in our own minds, that you would bring those things into obedience. There are many. There are many needs, Lord. There are many injustices. There are many things that are wrong that we see. But we know that these are wrong because you have stirred us and opened our eyes to notice. They are wrong because you, you are that are wrong. They, they are against your, your holy name. So, Lord, we ask that for your name, that you, that you put down that evil. Father, there are other needs beyond um, many that I don't know, but that are in this congregation and in the community around us, people in need right now of food, of shelter, of community, of fellowship. Lord, I pray that you would meet those needs and that we would be willing to be your vessels and your hands and your feet and your, your mouthpiece in those situations. And lastly, Lord, <clears throat> we want to, um, again, just call for your glory because in redeeming us, your glory is displayed. Lord, put, Lord, put down the, uh, the sins of idolatry, immorality, the sins that we commit by doing nothing, the sins of omission. It is for your sake, Lord, that we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, sorry, a slight change of plans here. I'm supposed to read the first uh, scripture reading. And this is Isaiah 41, 8 through 10. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand.
Thanks, Aaron. Thank you, Carol. Uh, before the service started, Carol was asking me about CJ's and my daughter, Junia Rose. Since you asked, and I love bragging about her, I'll share with you all. So she's going to be eight months on the 19th of this month. And, uh, and um, she's doing some new things. Carol, wisely as a mother, talked about this life phase of she starts doing new things every day, probably. That's, that's true. I left home this morning, and she was inside of a laundry basket. I've never seen her do that before. Her new favorite thing to do is to stand. As a matter of fact, if she's not standing, she's not happy. Uh, and one of the things that she'll try to do is she'll try to get us to pick her up with our hand. She'll just hang on, and we'll let her stand up, supported. She's a pretty drunk baby, shaky these days. But one of the things that she started to do is she started to find other things to pull herself up on, not just us. And she'll walk over to the, or crawl rather, over to the uh, coffee table or to a bucket or something and begin to try to pull herself up. It's just kind of fun to watch her grow, watch her adapt. And I'm uh, looking forward to you all getting to be around her a bit more at some point in the future. Uh, the story that I'm about to read for you from Matthew 14, it's important to note what happens immediately before it in order for us to be able to understand this story in context. What's happened right before this popular story is another quite popular story. Jesus has been with a very large group of people. It said that just the men alone were counted up to 5,000. And after some time of teaching them, they got a little hungry. And rather than sending them off into the village to get their own food, Jesus actually performs one of his most famous signs of power in multiplying just a few morsels of food into enough to feed more than 5,000 people. So that's what's just happened before we get to this part in Matthew. Um, I'd like to remind you that if you want to follow along at home, that's great. If you're note takers, that's great. But also, the spoken word of God is powerful unto itself. And so, if you just want to listen, that's perfectly good and fine. And just allow the power that's contained within these words to enter uh, your heart. So Matthew 14, verses 22 through 33. Hear the word of the Lord. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. Just a few weeks ago, Aaron Cross wisely pointed out that this happens quite a bit. After there's this significant sign of Jesus' power and authority, he will oftentimes go to be by himself. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, which had the disciples in it, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, Jesus came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if... It is you. Command me to come out to you on the water. Jesus said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to Peter, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When the two of them got into the boat, 
the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped Jesus, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Prepare our hearts, O Lord, to accept your word. I ask that you help to silence within us any voice other than your own, that in hearing your word we may begin to understand how to respond to it obediently. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. So I really like Matthew's gospel. A lot of people do. It tends to be of at least the synoptics, the one that has the most detail. There's a lot of careful attention to what's going on. I think especially in this story, it highlights just how well Matthew, the author, is able to paint this picture of the scene. So what's going on? Jesus has been by himself for quite a few hours. Jesus, the leader of these disciples, has been removed for some time. And the disciples have been on the sea, the Sea of Galilee. And my guess is that they've been out there longer than they were expecting to. Because even though they set off the previous evening, now that it's early in the morning, probably still dark, they're still out there. The text tells us this is because the wind is very strong, so much so that it's battering the boat. That word that gets used, battering, the word in Greek, it gets used a handful of times in the New Testament, but this is the only time it's translated this way. Every other instance, it's translated tormented or tortured. The disciples in this boat are being tormented by the harsh weather on the lake. These, many of them, are fishermen. So to their credit, they're probably relatively comfortable in this kind of environment. But even if you've done this a million times before, being on rough water, especially when it's dark, and especially when you're tired, that's going to make your blood pressure go up a little bit. CJ and I, we were uh, at Flathead Lake uh, just last month. It's a lake that I've canoed, I don't even know how many times. We thought that it would be a good idea just to take a little paddle around the cove. Again, I've been in that canoe on that part of that lake so many times. But even with her in front and me in the back steering, and the water was a little bit uh, rougher that day than we were used to, there were a couple times on that short paddle that we thought, we might be getting wet right now. Even though I've done that A lot of times, that still felt a little unnerving. The disciples on this sea are beginning to get a little afraid. And it's important to note one cultural piece about this in order to understand why they begin to become so afraid. See, the ancient world had this understanding of what the sea is, S-E-A. The sea is, for them, in this folk context, this sort of spiritually void abyss. It's this dark place. They didn't have scuba technology. They didn't have ways to be able to explore the depths. And so just looking into it, you know there's fish in there because you know how to fish them out of it. But beyond that, it's this unknown, unknowable, vast, empty void. So that's a component playing into them becoming to get just a little bit more uneasy. And then that's all compounded when all of a sudden the disciples from the boat see this unnatural event. Unprecedented is someone, a person, walking on top of what would have been pretty rough water. The human brain is pretty interesting. What we know now is that when the brain has a hard time understanding something, when it can't make sense, it can't compute something, then it tells us to be afraid of that thing. This is actually the reason that a lot of us are afraid of snakes. Snakes, in having this slithery movement, it's hard for our brains to grasp what's going on. If you've ever tried to catch a snake, 
when you reach for its body, all of a sudden it's not there anymore because it slithered off somewhere else. It's hard for us to understand what's going on. So because we can't understand it, our brains tell us to be afraid of that which we can't understand. The disciples, in trying to figure out what's going on, chalk this up to a ghost, not just walking on the water, but walking at them on the water. They don't understand what's going on, so they switch to fear. Well, what happens next should actually be the end of the story. As a matter of fact, when this same story is told in Mark's account and in John's account, it is the end of the story. Jesus says, it's me. No need to worry. Don't be afraid. And then gets in the boats and everything's good. But here, in Matthew's version of the story, this is the only account in which we have Peter enter the scene. (laughs) Peter, Peter, Peter. Uh, This is one of the most quintessential Peter-isms we have in the Gospels. Because even though Jesus has just, in kind of quoting Isaiah, the passage that Aaron read for us, in saying, don't be afraid, he's established himself, his authority as the leader here. We know elsewhere in the Gospels that when Jesus uses familiar language and he speaks to his followers that they are able to understand him and see him, identify him for who he is and his authority. Jesus has done this. He's, he's dissuaded their fears. He's made it clear that he's the leader in control of the circumstance. Peter. It's not good enough for Peter. Peter responds to Jesus' statement. The text says that he answered him. I didn't think that what Jesus said needed an answer. But Peter thought so. He said, okay, guys, don't worry. I got this. I'm going to get this figured out. I'm going to take control here. Okay, Jesus, if that is your real name, prove it. Prove to me you are who you say you are. Prove to me by doing something that only you could do. It's actually a pretty smart move. You see, Peter's testing Jesus. Jesus, in making himself known as his identity as their Lord, Peter's not buying it. He doesn't believe what Jesus says. And so he says, prove who you are by telling me to come out on this water. Now, a ghost might be able to float along the water. I believe that. But a ghost probably wouldn't have the power to be able to imbue that same power within me. I just watched you using the authority of your words multiply some fish and some bread into enough food to feed more than 5,000 people. I know that when you say things, Jesus, they happen. I know that there's power in your words. So command me, tell me to come out onto the water, and then we'll see who you really are. So Jesus, and this is sort of surprising to me, responds affirmatively to Peter's command. He says, okay, come on out. So with that first, maybe uncertain, wet but firm step, Peter is able to prove, yeah, this is Jesus. But then he keeps going, keeps walking. After what I'm guessing are a few shaky steps, he begins to become afraid because he realizes how strong this wind really is. And forgetting the power that Jesus has given him, he begins to doubt, he begins to sink, and he cries out, Lord, save me. I like that when in Matthew's version of this story, the word immediately is used, it's used to describe Jesus responding to the people he's caring for. He immediately reaches out and grabs Peter, keeps him from sinking. And then in this supreme teachable moment, he says, why did you doubt? The message translation here actually says, what got into you? I think Jesus is asking this rhetorical question 
for one particular reason. Because you see, in showing up, by walking on the water towards his disciples, Jesus, in saying, do not be afraid, has identified himself. He's there. He's their Lord. He's their teacher. He's the leader of this group. He's made himself known. Peter, however, thinks that's not good enough for me. I actually, in this situation, would like to try my hand at a little bit of control. I'd like to do a little bit of the leading right now. And Jesus says, what got into you? This is out of a response to feeling like Peter sort of got in his own way of being appropriately led. It's probably in no small part due to the fact that Peter's name is mine, as my last name being Peter's son, son of Peter, that I feel like so uncomfortably often I can just swap out Peter's name with mine and there's this sort of compelling application to my own life because you see, just as Peter gets in the way of him being able to be led by Jesus, I feel like I get in the way of being led by others all the time. And it's usually because I feel like I'm the one who's supposed to be doing the leading. I'll give you an example. Months ago, fresh after the killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and others, I was hot, angry, and that emotion was motivating me to act, to do. By the way, I'm still angry, and I'm still motivated. Months ago, I was taking that to be, I'm going to send emails. I'm going to preach about it. I'm going to call people. I'm going to start groups. We're going to talk about this, and we're going to fix this problem of racism. Had it. This has gone on for far too long. I, Drew Peterson, am going to end Racial injustice. At least that's what it sounded like to some people who I was talking to. I chatted with a couple colleagues of mine about one particular group I was trying to get going, one that was going to end implicit bias and racism within white people, and then starting in Spokane and spreading out from there to the other reaches of our country. We're going to end this problem. One of my friends who identifies as African American did a really good job of listening to me. And then she responded saying, wow, Drew, it sounds like you're really energetic about this. You have a lot of motivation here. really like the energy. That's great. Also, it sounds a little bit like you're trying to come in and fix a problem that some of us have actually been working on for quite a while now. She's right, of course. That's exactly what I was trying to do. Me, in identifying this issue, I just jumped in. I thought, okay, I'm going to take control of this. Step aside, black people. Let the white guy take care of this problem for you. Which was, of course, entirely unhelpful. Because by me attempting to exercise my own leadership in the situation, I was actually ignoring the leadership that was already there. Leadership that I would do well to be subservient to, to listen to, and to follow. My friend was very gracious with me. Because what I learned is that while it is important to have leadership in this one particular area, like racial reconciliation and ending racial injustice, it is important also to be aware of the leadership that has already been there. That was a growing edge for me. When Peter challenges Jesus, when he puts Jesus to the test, he actually gives Jesus two commands. First is he commands Jesus to tell him to come out onto the water. And Jesus responds, I told you, like, I'm surprised by it. He responds affirmatively. He says, sure, go on and do it. It's surprising to me because it seems like it would maybe even save some time if Jesus were to just say, 
shut up, Peter. Move aside. Let me get in this boat. Let me turn this wind off. That would have saved some time, but it would have been to the detriment of a valuable learning experience for Peter. The second command that Peter gives Jesus is to save him. He begins to fall into this abyss. Save me, Jesus. And once again, Jesus is right there. He catches him, responds to that command. Jesus, in some ways, is putting himself under the leadership of Peter, even though we all know that's not the way it's supposed to go. Jesus, in some ways, is kind of playing a learning game with Peter. Much in the same way that I will allow Junie to go over, crawl over to a table and begin to pull herself up. She struggles with it. Sometimes it's uncomfortable for her, but she's learning to develop these motor skills, these muscles, this cognitive ability to be able to do this on her own. Because if I just keep on standing her up on her own, she's never going to do it. As Peter is flapping his wings, testing out his leadership potential, Jesus goes along with it in the most gracious of ways. Because even though Peter is testing him in a way that we may say that didn't need to happen, Jesus allows this to be the sweet, gracious, teachable moment. So that when he has immediately reached out to grab Peter from falling into the sea, he asks him, what got into you? Now, I don't think that when Jesus asks that question, he's referring to the immediate doubt that Peter was experiencing while walking on the water and becoming frightened by the wind. I think Jesus, in asking about Peter's doubt, is actually hearkening back to the original doubt that Peter had from within the boat. The original doubt that caused Peter to exercise his own control of the circumstance, where Peter thought it would be a good idea for him to have some of his own leadership here. What got into you? Why did you think it would be a good idea for you to take control of a situation that I already had under control? Now, to be clear, I think that we ought to have and develop good leaders. Within our church, within Christianity as a whole, leadership is highly important. And Peter's a great example of that. After some valuable learning experiences, Peter is one of the people upon whom our faith was built, was grown. But it was after some time of learning whose leadership he's subservient to. We are no different. We've got good leaders, but if we are attempting to lead, those of us who are in the business of leading other people, if we attempt to lead from our own devices without remembering whose leadership we are first under, then we lead people to stumble into this abyss. Let me be clear. When I say those of us who are in the business of leadership, I am referring to people who are doing this. I'm talking about myself. This sermon, in many ways, is one that I have just needed to hear for myself. I need to be mindful of whose leadership I'm subservient to. Any of us who spend our time getting up here and doing this thing are held to this higher standard of not pointing towards us, but pointing instead towards the leadership of our Lord. I'm also talking about you, elders, and I'm talking about you, deacons. You are in the business of leading other people. My challenge to you is that you not forget whose leadership you are also under. I'm also talking about you, parents, because even though it may not feel like it all the time, your kids actually care a little bit about what you think, what you say, and so there is leadership opportunity there. Remember who you are pointing towards, whose leadership you ultimately are under. Any of you who have any sort of relational capital, 
with another person. It means that there is leadership potential there. Remember whose leadership you are under when you go to lead them. And just think about this. Who are the Peters in your life? Who are the people who, though it may feel like a waste of time in the moment, who are the ones who really need to flap their wings for a little bit? Who are the Junies who need to spend some time wrestling with standing? Who are the people who you can exercise good leadership in by allowing them to try their hand at it, even though it may not be so good? Here's the hard question, and this is a good question for me to ask myself. In what areas of your life, in what relationships, in what organizations are you being a bit Peter-ish? In what areas do you need to step back and remember, oh yeah, there's already some leadership here that I would do well to follow. hard for me to keep scripture in the front of my mind, even though I read it on a regular basis. It doesn't really stay in my head very well. And so in my encouragement to you, maybe you all are smarter than I am and you're able to keep the, this general message in the forefront of your mind for this week and longer. But one tool that's helpful for me, rather than just trying to think about words, is music. While I don't really have scripture floating through my head very often, I always have music in my mind. Music in the form of melody, rhythm, and the lyrics, too. This last song that we're going to sing is one that I uh, learned first at Camp Spaulding. I've been thinking about Spaulding a lot since they just had to shut down. And it's one that's a good reminder for us to remember under whose leadership we are. Lead me on, 
Jesus, lead on. Jesus, lead on. Now you can receive this benediction. May God bless you and keep you. May God shine light upon you. And may God be gracious to you. May you experience the presence and the leadership of God within you always. And may you, friends, have peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.